Well, good morning, boys and girls. This, this is a lecture which is called Science and Energy. I'd like to introduce ourselves first. I'm Dr. Ballantyne. This is Mr. Williams, and this is Dr. Jones. We all were chemistry teachers in universities. I taught chemistry here in Swansea for 40 years. Mr. Williams taught chemistry in Aberystwyth for 40 years. And Ms. Dr. Jones taught in University of Sheffield. We're all members and fellows of the Royal Society of Chemistry. And that's our famous shield up there. Now this lecture was devised by Mr. Williams following a response from the Royal Society of Chemistry who were thinking about how could they help education for primary schools and perhaps the first couple of years in secondary schools. And they wanted people to devise demonstration lectures that were interesting for young people. And Mr. Williams came up with an idea 20 years ago that wouldn't it be nice if we talked about energy? And so he devised this lecture called Science and Energy. And he has talked to 80,000 children. 80,000. Now, I helped him a few years ago, and I've probably talked to about 45,000. But I'm nothing like Bill. Bill. Bill Williams is fantastic. So before we start the lecture then, I would like to thank the University of Swansea for these wonderful facilities and the help they're doing. And as you can see, we're actually videoing this so that Mr. Williams can have a copy of the lecture before he has to give up doing this particular lecture. Now I'm going to start off, and Mr. Williams is going to come back uh, quite soon. The first thing I do is to ask a question. We're going to talk about heat. Can anybody tell me the temperature of their bodies? 37 Lovely. 37 degrees is exactly right. If you're fit and healthy, you're 37 degrees. Now, heat is a form of energy. So we've got to think to ourselves, in this lecture particularly, where did the energy come from? So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you another question. Where did you absorb the energy to make you hot, to make you keep you warm? I'll ask somebody else, shall I? Yes? You? Yes? Um, well, the sun helps, yes. But what about nighttime when you're in bed? There isn't any sun. But you're still warm, aren't you? So we must have absorbed some kind of energy all the time, or stored it up. Uh, yes? I can't hear you, love. Shout. The moon? Not the moon, no. The moon isn't very warm. Fat. Yes, OK. Um, are you thinking of the fat that's in your body? Yes. Well, what, what I'm thinking about is, you see, all of us, somebody might be very thin, but they'd still be able to keep themselves warm. So what did you have before you came to school this morning that was energy? Food. Food. Give her a clap. <laughs> it's the food that you eat that gives you the energy to keep you warm. So that's an energy transfer. It's the chemical energy stored in the food that's transferred in your body to heat to keep you warm. Now, we've got to go back another step. We've got to say to ourselves, OK, where did the food get its energy from? Now, food consists of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. And the carbohydrates are the most energy-giving part, and they're the sugars. So we're going to think, how is sugar produced? By chemicals. By chemicals, no. Where does sugar come from? Don't tell me Tesco's. No, no. Plants, yes, that's terrific. It comes from sugar cane, doesn't it? Sugar cane grows in nice warm countries. So somehow the, the plant gets energy from somewhere in order to make chemical energy in the sugar. So where would the plant get its energy from? From the sun, absolutely right. So we're talking about a process called photosynthesis. 
The sun gives energy to the plant, and the plant produces sugar. Can I have the next slide, please? Now, on this slide, you will see that what we've got is sunlight, solar energy, on green plants. It's got to be green because it's got to contain chlorophyll. And it absorbs water and carbon dioxide and turns them into sugar. And it stores the sugar in the plant. Next one, please. Now, this is a very important slide because it's telling us that you can't actually create or destroy energy. So what you have to do, if you want to have some energy, you have to pinch it from somewhere else. Like the sun gives the energy to the leaves, and the leaf makes chemical energy. The chemical energy then in your body makes heat. And these are all energy changes. Next, please. So let's think about photosynthesis. On the left-hand side, you can see the date palm and vines. Those fruits produce fructose and sucrose. Those are sugars. And they're very simple sugars. They have one ring in their structure. And the energy is stored in the chemical bonds. Oops, is that me? Uh, energy is stored in the chemical bonds of that molecule. When we eat it, the chemical bonds get broken, and we can use that energy. Now, sugar cane produces sugar as well, and that's sucrose, and that's one ring. And sugar beet, which we grow in our country, produces a different sugar, a sugar called sucrose, and that's the one you put in your tea. That's ordinary sugar. And that contains two rings. So these simple plants make either one ring or two rings joined together. Next, please. But in more complicated plants, like, for example, a potato, the potato makes the sugars in the leaves, stores it in the root, and it's starch that's produced. Now, starch doesn't contain one or two of these things. It contains hundreds or thousands of these sugars, all joined together. So when you eat starch, your body has to break it down into little bits before you can use it. And so we call this a slow-release carbohydrate. And it's just the same with cereals. Uh, wheat, oats, rice, they all produce starch, which is a big molecule, lots of uh, units. And again, it takes time for it to be broken down in your body. Now, think about this for a minute. If I wanted to run a marathon tomorrow, 26 miles, what would be the best form of energy that I could eat today? Healthy food. Healthy food. Now, that's not the answer I was looking for. Starch, yes. And in fact, if you're running a marathon, you have a pasta party the night before. Everybody running a marathon has pasta. They have spaghetti bolognese the day before. Because the next day, their body's got this energy, slow release, that will help them to run 26 miles. It's no use eating a chocolate bar, because that would be gone in no time. So therefore, if you want to run a long way, you've got to eat well the day before. Now, trees are something different, because they make sugars, and they make the trunk of a tree out of sugars. Can you believe that? The trunk of a tree is actually sugars. Only it's not one or two units, it's millions of units in a giant molecule called cellulose, and that's the trunk of a tree. Next one, please. So on the left-hand side, you can see heat, light, water, and carbon dioxide in the presence of chlorophyll makes cellulose and oxygen. Now that's really important, because that means that we're converting carbon dioxide into oxygen. Millions and millions and millions of years ago, there wasn't any oxygen on this planet. And it's only when green plants and green algae started that they converted the carbon dioxide into oxygen that the life was able to start in this planet because there was oxygen. And right now, one-fifth of our atmosphere that we're breathing is oxygen, all produced by green plants. So how many of you planted a tree? That's great. 
Everybody should plant trees because they're good for your grandchildren. So that's the way we get our oxygen. But if we look at the right-hand side of that slide, the stored energy in the wood, in the cellulose, you can get it back again. Because if you burn it in oxygen, you reverse the process, and look what you get. You get carbon dioxide and water, which is what you started with on the other side, but you also get light and heat. So there's an energy transfer. Light and heat goes into uh, stored chemical energy, and the stored chemical energy then goes into, uh, back again, into making carbon dioxide and water. Next one, please. So let's think about what happens in your body. In your body, sunlight produces the sugar. That's not me. And in your body, then, the, the energy change can go from sugar, which is a chemical energy, into heat that keeps you warm. But you don't actually just sit still and keep warm, do you? You run about and cycle, and those then are using, changing it into work energy in your muscles. And as well as that, if I want to move that finger, I have to tell it to move using my brain. So I'm sending an electrical message from my brain to that finger to say, move! And there it does it, you see. And it does it incredibly fast. So the chemical energy in the sugar is being changed into heat, into work energy, and into electrical energy in my body, all at the same time. So there are lots and lots of different kinds of energy. Next slide, please. And Mr. Williams is going to tell you about the different kinds of energy. There we go. On the di diagram, we've got a list of different types of energy that we hope to demonstrate uh, during this lecture. Uh, the ones are, which call for particular comment, I think, are six and seven. There'll be terms, I think, which aren't familiar to you. By potential, we mean uh, due to position. Uh, we've got an object there lying on the bench. Uh, if I lift it up, I've done work to raise it to this level, but at this level it now has potential energy. And uh, I can demonstrate that because when I release it, it falls. During that uh, fall, it has energy of motion, kinetic energy. Uh, so, we, uh, we've converted work energy to potential energy to kinetic energy. When it hits the bench, we get some sound. Sound is another form of energy. Uh, now, you may think that's a bit trivial, so let's um, consider a practical example. Yes, here it is. This is an illustration of what happens at the hydroelectric power station just outside Aberystwyth. Um, way up on the left, off screen, they built a big dam to uh, impound the wa waters of the river Rydal, about 2,000 feet above sea level. From the dam, they drove a four-mile long tunnel to discharge the water into the same river, 1,500 feet lower down. When the sluice gate on the dam is closed, the water is still, except for the friction of the wind on the water, when you open the sluice gate, the water then flows down the tunnel, and during its flow, of course, it then has kinetic energy, energy of motion. Uh, at the power station, which is, uh, 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 straddles the river 1,500 feet lower down, the uh, flowing water encounters a water wheel. There you are, you can see that's the water wheel. The running water makes the water wheel spin, so the kinetic energy there has been converted to work energy, and the shaft of the uh, water wheel is connected to the shaft of the electric generator. So we have here a system then which uh, uh, can convert potential energy into 
kinetic energy into work energy, and finally into electricity. Um, well, we don't have time to just consider that further. Uh, next one, please. Yes. Now, we're actually going to start the experiments, and we'll, uh, I'll need two volunteers for this. And we. Could we have four from St. Helens to replace those down there, please, immediately? Could we? Now, we're, we're going to mix two chemicals, and the purpose, uh, object of this experiment is to find out whether we, when we mix these two chemicals, which you'll simply call A and B, whether there is a heat change. What do we need in order to measure heat? How do we, anybody? Yes. A thermometer, yes. Um, well, uh, the type of thermometer you're familiar with is a mercury and glass thermometer and uh, quite useless on an occasion like this. Uh, we can do rather better with these uh, digital thermometers. In the little beaker here, we've got a, uh, a liquid, which that's our chemical A. And in a minute, uh, my assistant is going to add this second chemical, B. A will react with B to produce uh, C and D. And what we want to find out is whether there is a heat change. Um, now, what, can you all see? What, can somebody say what, the, what is the temperature of this liquid? Uh, uh, yes, yeah, so it's 18.6 actually. Never, never mind the, the decimal plate uh, point. Um, so that's the temperature of our liquid here. Uh, my assistant here, oh, before we do that, we need to uh, stir it, so... In the liquid we've got a little piece of magnetized iron uh, encased in, in plastic and that's spinning round because below the iron plate here is a spinning magnet so the little magnet in the liquid is following the spinning magnet. Um, now we're ready to mix them so just uh, tip all that in to the beaker please. What's happening? Getting hot, yes. Uh, would you like to feel the outside of the beaker, you too? Well, that's a, uh, this is how sugar behaves in your tum when you eat it. Uh, the chemical process goes on in your tum, and um, heat is given out, and that's what keeps you warm. Now, we've got the same uh, liquid here, and we're going to stir it. Which, which, which is, press the green button, please. That's fine. Yeah, that's fine. What's the temperature? Right? Let's see what happens this time. Uh, whose turn? It's your turn, yeah. Just tip that in there, please. Like to feel the outside? Cold. <laughs> What's the temperature now? 
So I've gone down from 18.7, is it, to 3.5. So not all chemicals react together to give out heat. Some behave like this, in which heat is taken in. Uh, this latter experiment uh, is an example of what the chemist calls an endothermic reaction, and you'll hear about those in more advanced chemistry courses. Give him a big hand. <laughs> It is uh, fortunate, isn't it, that uh, when we eat sugar, it behaves like the first experiment, and heat is given out instead of being taken in. We have got a couple. Right. Will you, will you come along uh, behind the bank? Further, further along, please. F further along, and you two stand there. Now, we're going to mix some more chemicals, and we'll see what happens this time. The liquid in each flask is water in which are dissolved chemical A and chemical B. You can see they're different due to the color. And what my two assist first two assistants are going to do is to pour these simultaneously into the conical flask. Two here, oh, I'm sorry. Um, each of you pick up a flask, please. We want you to pour into this at the same time. You must pour together and don't overflow the flask. Ready? And right sound, please, Dr. Jones. Start pouring. Okay. Lights out, Bill. Okay. Uh, will you feel the outside of the flask, please, and tell me whether it's got hot? Cold, yes, sometimes called cold light. The chemist calls it chemiluminescence, a chemical reaction taking place not with the production of heat, but with the production of light. This is a very remarkable reaction uh, in that... Uh, over 99% of the chemical energy in A and B is converted to light energy, so there's no energy left to be converted to heat energy. Well, everybody likes to see that done, so I suppose we better do it again, hadn't we? Right. Well, um, Dr. Ballant, we've got the same pair of chemicals. Um, all Dr. Ballantyne was doing was dividing each portion uh, into two parts, so we've got two more experiments to do. So we're going to mix the same chemicals, uh, but uh, going to proceed slightly differently. So you need to watch carefully what happens. <clears throat> this bottle contains a uh, chemical called a fluorescer. Can you all say that, please? A fluorescer. fluorescer. Right. Now, my assistant is going to squirt that fluorescer into there. Squeeze it up near the top. There we are. Right. Now, watch carefully, and then you'll be able to tell me uh, what the fluorescer does. Each of you pick up a flask, and Dr. Jones will turn the lights out. Please, lights out, please. Start pouring. Oh. What, well, what did the fluorescer do? Yes? We got green light, yes? If you were 
writing the two experiments up in your notebook for your teacher, what would you say? In the first experiment, what did you see? Blue light, yes. The only difference then was it must have been due to the what? To the fluorescent. So yes, the fluorescent then has the ability and the power to change the colour of the light which is produced. Well, we. Um, got one missing, have not we? It's here. Oh. It's, it's that one, is it? Oh. No. I think it's those two. There we are. No, okay. it should be this. All right. Well, we've got a different floor assay here. Let's see what happens this time. We'll put the floor assay in there. Will you, uh, next person, please, squirt that in there. Take the glasses off and put Good. them on here. Now, that's it. You pick up a flask and you pick up another one. Right, so please, Dr. John. So a different fluorescer gave a different color. Um, now, I've got uh, we can do this experiment in a different way. We're going to uh, do it with one of these. I expect you, many of you have used these. You can buy them in camping shops and hardware stores, but you possibly don't know how they work. So we've got a diagram on the, on the middle screen here, if you'd all look at it. Uh, the, uh, in the top diagram there, number one, uh, you see the plastic tube contains a little glass tube. And that little glass tube has been filled with chemical B and then sealed up. And the sealed tube has been put in the plastic tube and then the plastic tube has been filled up with the other chemical, A, and a cap has been put on the end of the tube. In this condition, nothing can happen and won't happen until we break the glass tube, which we do by bending it. So the way you do this, uh, please, is you put your thumbs together and your, th uh, your f forefingers there and bend it towards your chest. Thumbs together. You go crack. Bend it. Really hard. There we are. Well done. Shake it up and hold it up. Well done. Oh. <laughs> right. Lights on then. Thank you. <laughs> now, these will glow for about uh, 12 hours. Whereas the experiments we did in the glass vessels on the bench only lasted a few seconds, didn't they? Why the difference? Well, in those experiments, we were only using a few milligrams of A and B, whereas these contain much more of A and B. Now, this contains the same chemicals A and B as this one. This one is giving orange-red light, this one is giving um, yellow-green light. How, is, how has the manufacturer achieved that? How is it that we're getting different light by mixing the same two chemicals? Yes? Couldn't hear that. You have to shout louder. Different coloured fluorescers. Right, yes. These contain uh, this contains a different fluorescent to this. When you go to the hardware 
stores or the camping shop, I think the shopkeeper will offer you a range of something like seven colours. The next time you go there, then you'll be very wise, won't you? Because you'll know that all those seven varieties contain the same chemicals A and B, but each variety contains a different what? Fluorescent. Different fluorescent. You've got it, yes. <coughs> um, well, these have some practical uses. Um, a white one useful on a campsite after dark, or if you're a scuba diver, you can safely take them below water, uh, whereas a, a torch might um, get wet. <coughs> um, some people, I don't suppose you yet, like crawling around in caves uh, and narrow passages. And uh, I know you have a hard hat with a, a lamp on it, but uh, these passages are very tortuous, aren't they, and not level. Uh, how do you know that uh, you're not going to fall down a hole? Well, uh, what you do these days is you take a supply of these things and a supply of string, a large supply of string, and if you're uncertain how to proceed, you um, tie a piece of string on and crack one and, and uh, drop it down the hole in front of you. That'll give you an indication of whether it's safe to, to, go, to proceed. <coughs> RAF aircrew have these uh, things like this as part of their survival gear. So if you're sitting, in, if you crash in the North Sea and sitting in your dinghy waiting to be rescued, particularly in bad visibility, the rescue boat will see you much more uh, quickly. Uh, I wouldn't like you to go away uh, concluding that w what you've seen here now is a sort of chemist trick in the laboratory. This is a phenomenon that occurs in nature. Does anybody know about chemiluminescence in nature? What creatures can give off light? Yes? Glow worms? Glow worms? Yes, very good. Any more? Yes? Yes? Fireflies. Yes, it's only one sex of the firefly which gives out the light. So in that case, it's a sex attractant. Um, how many of you have watched this uh, wonderful series on the BBC screen called The Blue Planet? Yes, well there were some remarkable shots weren't there of fish which live uh, at considerable depth in the ocean. These have become adapted to uh, uh, living at uh, this depth where there's no light and where there is considerable pressure. And uh, in order to find a food and find mate, they have developed this f facility to generate light uh, in certain glands on the body by means of this process of chemiluminescence. In the same series, there were uh, remarkable shots of jellyfish pulsating with different colored light. And uh, these series are, are repeated from time to time, I urge you to look at them next time. <laughs> uh, I think there was another series, wasn't there, Finding Nemo? Anyway. Yeah, well, uh, uh, what you saw there was another example of uh, chemiluminescence. Well, we must okay, hasten on. Give him a big hand. Well, so a big hand. Can we have two? Now, in the two demonstrations just two. you just see, in the two demonstrations you've just seen, we converted chemical energy into heat, and in the last experiment we converted chemical energy into light. Now we're going to show that we can convert chemical energy into electricity. And uh, they're going to re reconstruct, uh, in a modern way, the invention of the first battery. Now, if you'd lived in the 18th century, that is in the 17, uh, 1700s, 
uh, if you were sufficiently well off, you would li have lit your homes by, uh, uh, by oil lamps. Uh, if you weren't so well off, you'd, you'd probably be candles. But there was no electricity, uh, so there were no washing machines and no hair dryers and so on, and no electric light. Electricity was known in the form of lightning from thunderstorms and uh, uh, static electricity by rubbing certain materials together, but uh, neither was of, uh, neither of these forms of energy was of direct application. But in 1797, a man named Alessandro Volta changed all that. Volta uh, invented the first battery. Uh, it's too difficult uh, uh, on an occasion like this to demonstrate Volta's battery, but I can uh, explain how it worked. It consisted of alternate plates of copper and zinc, copper, zinc, copper, zinc, and each pair of plates was separated by paper uh, soaked in salt water. And the, the bottom copper plate was connected by a wire to the top plate, the zinc plate. Uh, the more plates you had, the bigger the voltage you, you got from it. Humphrey Davy uh, built one, I think, which contained a hundred pairs of plates. It's a wonder he, he didn't suffer uh, injury. But he made a marvelous contribution to uh, uh, chemistry in that he showed, first of all, that w water consists of hydrogen and oxygen, although surprisingly, he didn't measure the relative amounts of hydrogen and oxygen that, were pr uh, that he produced in that first experiment. But he also isolated for the first time a number of metals in group one and two of the periodic table, which you'll learn about when you go to secondary school. Uh, sodium, potassium, barium, strontium, and uh, uh, magnesium, I think. That was a remarkable achievement, all done with the aid of uh, Volta's battery. Uh, but uh, a few years later, a man named Daniel invented uh, what's called the Daniel cell, and it's the Daniel cell which my assistants are going to uh, reconstruct now. <clears throat> uh, in the diagram on the on your uh, right, see we uh, have a, a, a beaker containing copper sulfate solution. This is copper sulfate. It dissolves in water to give a blue solution, and it contains a strip of copper metal. There's a piece of copper metal. And there's a, uh, some copper wire, uh, golden brown, shiny metal. In great demand in modern civilization. The other part of the cell contains a zinc sulfate solution. Uh, that is zinc sulfate, so that's colorless, dissolves in water. And that ne uh, needs a, a piece of uh, zinc metal. Um, We've been testing this this morning, and it's got corroded a bit, but when it's clean, it's bright and shiny and, and silvery colored. Now, we need a means of detecting and measuring the electricity, and here we have a splendid voltmeter. Voltmeter named after Alessandro Volta. When you encounter this term meter in science, it means it's a device for measuring something. A thermometer measures thermos, the Greek word for heat. A voltmeter measures volts, which is a unit of electrical energy. A speedometer measures, of course, speed. So let's uh, see if we can make this work, shall we? Um, will you put the copper strip in, in the copper sulfate, please? What are you going to do? Spread it. Just, yeah, just, just put it in. Okay. You don't have to hold it. No, just, just leave it there. That's it. And will you clip that onto the copper metal? Do you know how it works? Yeah. And that's the red one. Here it is. So I want you to put, uh, uh, plug that into the positive terminal, the plus terminal of the voltmeter. That's good. Now, will you do the same with the zinc, please? 
costante dentro però. Sì. Ok. Now this has got a window in the back so you can see what's happening and the audience can too. Are we producing electricity? No. Why, uh, why not? Can anybody tell me why not? Hand goes up. Pardon? Yes, there's something in the diagram that you should look at. Is there something missing? Yes? Salt bridge, yeah. Um, well, for an occasion like this, a very simple salt bridge is all we need in the form of a piece of wet cotton cloth. So, um, yes, can you show the meter? My colleague will testify that it worked perfectly at 8 o'clock this morning. Ah, there we are. Now, they may be suspicious that we've got some hidden battery here, so lift the uh, red one out, will you? Just Just straight out of the liquid. T t and what happens to the meter? Put it, put, put it back in again, all right, and you do the same for the zinc. So there's no uh, deception here, and uh, so the voltmeter is telling us that we're getting so many units uh, of electricity. We can say at once then that there must be an energy difference between these two metals, which under these conditions we can convert to electricity. <coughs> what is not apparent, but uh, would be very easy to demonstrate if we had lots of time and a chemical balance, is that there is a chemical reaction going on. What we would do then would be to weigh the two metal strips before we start the battery w running. Run the battery for uh, a certain length of time and then weigh the strips again. Now what we would find is that this one, the copper strip, gains weight. All the time I'm talking to you, the copper strip is gaining weight and uh, the weight would uh, show that this, the zinc one is losing weight. Now if you think about it, uh, the, there's only one way in which that can happen. Copper sulfate, that's that, must be turning into copper metal, that. And as this is losing weight, zinc metal must be dissolving to make zinc sulfate that's zinc sulfate which we know is soluble in water so that unit then gives us so much uh, uh, electrical energy if I took the voltmeter out of circuit and had a little flash bulb we could light that flash bulb from the electricity that we're producing but if you brought your electric train along, uh, you'd probably say to me, that's no good, I want double that. Now, how could we amend this or adapt this arrangement to give twice the amount? Yeah? Put another piece of copper sulfate in and zinc in. Yeah. Another piece of copper sulfate and zinc, he said. Yeah, yes, that's right. In other words, we want another pair of these, is that right? Yeah. Yes, right. Uh, well. Um, we've got an, uh, a splendid uh, diagram here. Yes, here it is. See, uh, on the left is is this. Uh, but if we have a second pair uh, uh, coupled up in series, then we get double the voltage. <coughs> and uh, we've got that's exactly the same thing that happens inside a torch, because this torch needs three volts. So what's it got inside? got one and a half volts in this battery and another one and a half volts. So you put the two together, you get three volts that lights the bulb. So here we have two Daniel cells giving the right voltage. 
there is another way of getting uh, a bigger voltage. Uh, what I've done here is to take away the zinc solution, and I'm going to replace it with this, which is magnesium sulfate. There it is. Um, yes. And uh, we need a, a salt bridge for that, of course. And as it's magnesium sulfate, then we need a piece of magnesium metal. There it is. Uh, put it in the bulldog clip. And my assistant is going to dip it in the... Do this for me. Get hold of that and just dip it into that one and look at the meter. Oh, we, we get a bigger voltage this time, don't we? Take it out. Uh, Pop it in again. Yeah. That's lovely. Okay. We, we have then a, a, a bigger energy difference between magnesium and copper than between zinc and copper. Now, you'll learn more about this in years to come when you hear about uh, the reactivity series, which enables you to read off at a glance the different voltages that you get between different pairs of metals. And the battery, battery manufacturer makes use of this, of course, to produce batteries of different voltage. <coughs> Right, thank you very much. Give him a big hand. You want to do that? Yeah. Well, we've seen that we've converted chemical energy into light and chemical energy into heat and chemical energy into electricity. Well, this time, we're going to do a change that involves changing heat into electricity. Now, this is something that's not done very often, and it involves an, uh, an apparatus called a thermocouple. And the thermocouple is on our next slide. No. Oh, sorry, we're out of, out of uh, sequence. Stay there. We'll do the thermocouple in a minute. Uh, what we want to show you is that you have different kinds of torch bulbs these days. This particular torch is a standard torch, it's like the one on the left. Next slide, please. And what it has is a uh, tungsten filament, and the problem with that is that the tungsten filament heats up, gets very hot, and if it gets too hot, it bursts. And that's why your light bulbs go out. So therefore, uh, in recent times, a new type of bulb has been developed called a light-emitting diode, an LED. And LEDs are now used in many different functions. They're in traffic lights. They're in uh, television controls. They're all sending infrared signals. But the one I want to show you is in this torch. Uh, and the next slide shows how they're made. We have a brick of semiconductor material, and we put the electrodes on each side of the brick, and we put a small current of low voltage on, and it doesn't heat up at all. It doesn't get hot, but it gives off light. And the interesting thing is, by designing the brick, the semiconductor brick, you can make it all different colors. And the next slide shows you a whole variety. Oh, that, that was not there, is it? That's the one, yes. So what you've got here, you see, is LED colors. You can have red, infrared, green, orange, red, yellow, etc., just by changing the elements that you make the brick up with. This particular torch is one of the strongest torches you'll ever see because it contains 30 white light emitting diodes. Lights out, then. Can we turn the lights out? And what we've got here, then, is a, a light-emitting diode torch that really is quite bright. I don't want to shine it on you, but you can see it's a very bright light. And this is white. And I'll leave the lights out. And if I simply click it again, what I get instead is a red light-emitting diode, and this is a sort of safety torch. 
Now that's white and red. Light out. Yeah, sorry. All right? Yeah. What we've got as well is a whole variety of different colours. This is a Christmas tree light. These are light emitting diodes. Every one of these is a little brick made of different uh, chemicals. And you can see all the different colours we get. Now, the advantage of this is it doesn't get hot, so it doesn't burn up. And these will last for something like 100,000 hours. That's a lifetime. So my wife doesn't need to buy any more Christmas lights, ever. Now, the interesting thing is if we switch them off, can you find the switch there, Bill? Um, wrong one. You can see, although the lights go out, some of the, the lights are still on. And that's because this is a fluorescence. And some of these, the, particularly the blues and the greens, will last for a little time. And then they'll gradually switch themselves off. But there's no electricity going into this. It's stored energy in the bulbs. OK, lights, please. Did we switch off the computer? Sir? You didn't switch off the computer, did you? Oh, no. God, yeah. <laughs> OK, so now we're ready to do the thermocouple. thermocouple experiment. I'm sorry I got those out of order. The thermocouple is an incredibly simple piece of apparatus. It's simply two wires. You can see here there's a black wire and a grey wire, and the black wire and the grey wire are joined at what are called the thermocouple junctions. And the other ends go into the voltmeter. Now these are my thermocouple junctions. And this is the end that goes into the voltmeter. So can you come and help me then, please? Can you put that one in one of those holes? Doesn't matter which. And that one you can put into this one. And we'll turn it around so everybody can see it. And here I have my, my thermocouple. Got the two junctions, it's all connected up. Now the interesting thing about this apparatus is that uh, uh, now we will do it. We're going to light this a flame. The interesting thing about this apparatus is quite simply, if there is a difference in temperature between the two ends, between the two thermocouples, we get a voltage. And the voltage flows from the high to the low. So what we're going to do is we're going to put one end of these uh, device into ice water, and the other one I'm going to put into a flame. <coughs> and the flame has a temperature of about 900 degrees. So we need glasses. Can you put the glasses on? So can one of you take this, please? Hold it. And can you come around the other side? Put it in the water, inside, and hold it down. Hold it in. Don't push it on bottom. Don't push it on bottom. Now you hold this. Now, you've got to hold it really well, like that. Now, what I want you to do is put it in the flame until it glows. All right? So we're going to have it up about there. Now, watch the meter. What's happening to the meter? How high is it going? It's about three, isn't it? OK? So I'm going to take this one out. You leave yours in. Hold on. I'll just switch this off. Now what I want you to do is cool it down. The best way to cool it is imagine it's a birthday candle and blow it out. You give it a good blow, really hard. Now watch the meter. As, keep going. As she's blowing it, then the meter goes down and it will gradually get down to zero. Now, when it's very close, we can actually put them in the water. It'll go fizz, are you ready? And there we are, it's gone down to naught. So as these are at the same temperature, we get no voltage. But when they're at different temperatures, we get a voltage. Now, 
there was 900 degrees between the water and the flame. Can we make it bigger? Can we get a bigger difference? Could you just uh, go back on the edge there? Come to something that, that's it. Stay there. I need you again. So what we're going to do is we're going to find something that's colder than ice. And what I've got here is a liquid inside my flask. Anybody tell me what it is? I'll pour some out on the bench. You watching? Anybody tell me what it is? Liquid nitrogen. He's absolutely right. So what I've got here is a flask of liquid nitrogen. It's cold in here. Somebody tell me the temperature. What temperature do you think it's in there? <coughs> Minus 100. It's colder than that. No, love, no. Nothing on earth can be lower than minus 273. Minus 150. It's colder than that. That's it. Absolutely on the button. Minus 198. It's almost 200 degrees. Minus 200. So here's a liquid. Minus 200. What would happen, I wonder, if I put my hand in here? Well, immediately, I would get frostbite. My hands would turn black, and my fingers would fall off. So this is not something we're going to play games with, and that's why my assistants are standing over there. Now, I'm going to put something in this liquid to make it at minus 200 degrees, and I'm going to use a piece of rubber tubing. Now, when I put it in here, it's going to boil and nitrogen is going to be produced, and the rubber tubing is gradually going to cool and cool and cool until it becomes minus 273. Almost, almost. When it gets to 273, it will stop boiling. So this uh, liquid at the bottom here is minus 200 degrees. So is my piece of rubber tube. Now, one end of the rubber tube is as it was before, flexible, and the other end of the rubber tube is pretty hard. <laughs> Any good with a hammer? Put the glasses on. Take this from me. Come here. Whoa! She's going to hit the end. Stand back. She's going to hit the end that hasn't been cooled. Can you do that for me? Just there. Harder. That's lovely. Now once on the end that's been cooled. Stand back. Try again. That's it. Lovely. So what we've got now is a piece of rubber tubing that's totally shattered. It's like a brick or like a piece of glass. It's not like rubber anymore. That was well done. Smashing. Now, I have a piece of rubber tubing that's hopeless. What will happen if it warms up? I want people to put their hands up, please. Will it recover and be rubber again? Hands up. And is it gone forever? Hands up. Well, let's find out, shall we? Well, what I'm going to do is... I'm going to cool it down again, because that's fun. Now I need to warm it up. So what have I got here that I could warm it up in? I've got water. So I'm going to warm it up in water. Because water is 200 degrees hotter. Isn't that right? So gradually this is going to get hot. It's going to come up to room temperature or ice temperature. And we want to see whether it's going to be flexible anymore. And there it is. It's back to rubber again. It's not like my hands, they would be gone forever, but the rubber is back to rubber tubing again. Now the reason we're using liquid nitrogen is to get a very low temperature. Minus 200 and the flame 
is 900. So now we've got 1100 degrees. Got the lighter? Got the lighter? Yeah. Off we go. Lovely. So now we're going to put one probe in liquid nitrogen, and we're going to put one in 900. Can you remember what the meter told us last time? How high did it go? Right. We're going to try and get better. Glasses on. And I want you to wear gloves. You're right-handed? Put that on your right hand, and you put that one on, please. Okay, come, come this way. Now, you did the cold, didn't you? You're going to do the warm, as you did before. Did you do the warm last time? It's the other way around. Come over this side. Now, I want you to just put it in the flame exactly as you did before. Uh, it's a bit higher up. Make it glow. I want you to hold it there and just dip it in until it goes fizz. That's fine. And what's the meter telling us? It should go up to five. Almost at five now? Okay, we can take that one out. That's lovely. Very well done. Okay, thank you very much. Give him a big hand. Some glasses and gloves. So as we increase the temperature, we get a larger voltage. Not a lot, because it's only between 900 and 1100, which is not too much. There's an application of what you've just seen uh, every day, not very far from here, in the steelworks. At Port Talbot, uh, when you're making iron, uh, you need to know the temperature in the blast furnace and when it's time to pour off the molten metal from the slag, as it's called. Um, you can't use a mercury and glass thermometer because we're talking about uh, temperatures uh, above a thousand degrees. Uh, the way they find out the temperature is by means of a thermocouple. Uh, in the steelworks, they call it a pyrometer. But it's, uh, it means exactly the same thing. <clears throat> We've now generated electricity in two ways. One by means of the chemical battery, and now by means of the thermocouple. <clears throat> Both of those uh, devices give uh, what's called direct current. Uh, you don't know anything yet about electrons and so on, but very simply, in direct current, the electrons flow only one way round the circuit. <coughs> and you'll see the difference in just a minute. What we're going to do now is to reconstruct uh, an experiment done by Michael Faraday in the Royal Institution in 1831. <coughs> Faraday had been puzzling for some time about the relationship between magnetism and electricity. Uh, for instance, it was been known for some time that if you had a current flowing uh, in a circuit and you brought a compass needle uh, near, uh, near it, the compass needle was deflected. So there appeared to be some relationship between uh, magnetism and electricity. And now in this uh, famous experiment, which is, um, well, can we have the diagram please? Yes, here it is. He had a long coil of wire, which you see, lower part of the diagram, connected to, uh, well, it wasn't a voltmeter, it was an electroscope, but we'll call it a voltmeter, and he had a powerful magnet. Now, what he observed was that as he moved the magnet into the coil of wire, he got a deflection on his voltmeter. As long as the magnet was moving, but if he stopped moving it, uh, the, the uh, pointer went back to zero. When he withdrew the magnet, he again generated electricity, but the, the um, voltmeter gave an indication 
in the opposite direction as long as the magnet was moving. So by oscillating the magnet to and fro, he was, for the first time, I think, uh, producing what we call an alternating current. Now we're going to reproduce this experiment. Uh, I have here um, what physicists call an induction coil. There's about 4,000 turns of copper wire wound on a frame here. And as you see, there's a channel down the middle in which you're going to insert a magnet in a minute. <coughs> We've got a pair of terminals here. Those are, these are the ends of the coil of wire. And uh, uh, I want you two to connect this up to the voltmeter, please. So plug it into one of those and into one of those. Good. Right, well, we turn the voltmeter around. Everybody can see it. So we've got our um, coil um, connected to the voltmeter as in the diagram. Now we want a magnet. Well, I've got a magnet here adhering to a piece of uh, iron metal. And you may say that's an insignificant looking magnet. Well, let's see. This is a lump of steel which weighs about half a kilo. Uh, do you want to hold that there? And I want you to lower it down over the, uh, over the middle of the magnet. That's it. Lift it up, please. Yes. Can you get it off? Oh, well done. But it took a, 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 some strength, didn't it, to pull it off? Yes. Okay. Well, now you can do what Michael Faraday did all those years ago. We, uh, hold it there, then. And we're going to insert it into the coil of wire and uh, hold it. Now, yeah, you must keep holding it. And now we're going to oscillate it to and fro the Everybody watch the meter. And as long as he moves the magnet to and fro within the coil of wire, he generates what we call an alternating current. But uh, if he stops moving it, loose go, just, just leave it in there. He stopped moving the magnet. The magnet is still in the coil, but we're not producing electricity. Uh, so that was the... This is an experiment which has possibly been of the greatest benefit to mankind ever since because it was the uh, foundation of the electric generating industry. And ever, ever since, uh, chemists, uh, physicists and engineers have been building bigger and bigger devices uh, in which a magnet is moved within a coil of wire. This is a device that was invented about a couple of years ago that uses Faraday's principle. It doesn't have a battery. What it's got instead is a magnet and two coils and a couple of rubber buffers. And if you shake it backwards and forwards, you can hear the magnet going through the coils. And every time it goes through, it makes some electricity and it stores it up. Can you do this for me? Like that. Okay. That's lovely. Keep going. Now he's using his work energy, his muscles, to make electricity. Okay. Stop now. Can you switch it on for us? And point it at the camera. So what, and point it at the audience. So what we've got now is a torch that didn't have a battery. And that's using Faraday's principle exactly. Okay, next slide. Well, Faraday reasoned that uh, to oscillate, uh, to generate electricity continuously by oscillating a magnet to and fro within a coil of wire perhaps wasn't the most convenient and efficient way of doing it. So he conceived the idea of spinning a magnet within a coil of wire. We have a little device here which illustrates it. I can't open this up, but inside this metal case is a long coil of wire. You can see the terminals uh, here. Uh, the black knob is, an, uh, is attached to a metal shaft, and on the end of the shaft, inside the device, is the magnet. So by turning the black knob, 
you are spinning the magnet within the coil of wire. Uh, this is your jump, I think. Uh, will you plug that into the uh, uh, voltmeter, please? Are you, are you right handed? You're left. Left handed, okay, doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to hold this here then, and I want you to uh, turn that slowly in one direction. It doesn't matter which way, but you, just one direction, yeah? Yes, you're doing very well. You see, you see he's producing uh, an alternating current. We're going from plus two to zero to minus two back to zero. Uh, and uh, this is the principle on which the public electricity supply works. Only uh, the magnet in the public electricity supply is spinning much faster than he's doing here. In fact, 50 times a second. So the, these lights actually are going out 50 times a second, but that's too fast for the human eye to, to see. So this is uh, Faraday's electric generator. And ever since, uh, as I say, engineers have been building bigger and bigger electric generators. Well done. <coughs> this is an electric generator. Now, so uh, what he's been doing, of course, and uh, his uh, friend before that is doing work. Moving a magnet, you've got to do work. If we reverse the process, if I had a suitable battery and plug this in, now I would have an electric motor. And what would happen then is that this knob would spin round. Of course, that's what happens in your hair dryer. And <laughs> there, there we are. And uh, uh, the vacuum cleaner and anything that's got an electric motor in it. Can I have the floor of you, please? Yeah. Next slide. Oh, yeah. Now then, we're going to use their work energy to make some electricity. What I want you to do is to hold that and wind it like that. One for you. Wind it like that. Be careful now. Yeah. You got one for you. Wind it like that. And one for you. Not too, not too fast. Like this, that sort of speed. Okay, can you do that one? Now what my four assistants are doing is they're using their work energy to store electricity. They're generating electricity and they're storing it in these devices. And these devices we can use for various purposes. Having a lot of trouble with that one? Yeah. Let me show you how, like that. Okay, can you all stop now? Hold on to your things. This one is a lovely little generator. It's a torch, you see? It's also a radio. On the website, torch of my love. <laughs> radio three. All sorts of rubbish. But this is a real generator because what this can do is it can charge up your mobile phone. Because you're out in the country saying your mobile phone's gone dead and you must make a call, it's an emergency. If you've got one of these, you just connect it up to your mobile phone, wind the handle, it, wind, it makes the battery, uh, it charges it up, and there you have it. Okay? This one is a, we can have the lights on, yeah. This one's a tiny little radio. Hopefully it hasn't been... This is classic FM. And it's also a torch. Can you see? Shower proof. You can take it in the shower. <laughs> this one is a marvellous torch. It contains five LEDs. Press once, and you get two. Oh, it's not being wound very well. I need to do it myself. I'm doing it fast. Not that I said you had to do it fast. There we go. Now I've got five LEDs, or two, 
or five. And this then is a marvelous torch. Again, no battery. And this is the one I like because if you have a power cut at home, all you need is this, switch it on, and there you have a lantern that will last all night. And in fact, I'm going to put it over here for the rest of the lecture, and let's just see how long it lasts. Well, thank you, assistants. Give them a really big hand. We need six. The next six, please. I'm ready to go. Ready to go. Yes. Uh, glasses. Yeah, yeah. We, need, we need the some burner. Yes. Glasses. Take one and move along. See if my arms are you One each. <laughs> Could we have two from... Come on this way. Come on. St. Helen, step down there, please. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's the, uh, yeah. the flint that needs moving. Yeah. Right, can you come this way, please? <clears throat> now, listen carefully. We're going to activate some chemicals in these trays. And in order to activate them with a lot of heat, we've covered them in a very flammable liquid. And you're going to set them alight. And if you do that, we'll get some very nice bright colors. So, all right, Bill? Yes. Head off. So, when you start, I want you to light this splint in the flame and then just touch it on there and immediately hand the splint to your neighbor who will uh, light the next one and so on down the line. But you had to move out of the way as soon as you've done your yeah. bit. So, move towards Dr. Ballantyne. Just touch it and then let go. That's fine. Come away now. Lights out. Next person, grab it. Come on. Come this way. Middle one, that's back. Come right around the corner. Stand, go and stand over there. And we're up. Over here. Now you've got something different to do. Now, I'm trying to explain as simply as possible what's happening here. Each of these trays contains a salt of a different metal. This was copper, the middle one there nearest to you is strontium, the uh, uh, lilac one is uh, lithium, the green one here is boron, and uh, the yellow one is sodium. We're, we're burning this uh, uh, liquid to provide a lot of heat to excite an electron in the, in the metal. And it's that excited electron which uh, then uh, gives out some of this energy as colored light. And this, uh, what you see here, has long been used by uh, chemists in the 19th century for detecting um, uh, different metals uh, by the way I am able to identify them by the, by, by the different color that is produced. <coughs> uh, in more modern times, of course, you see these colors in fireworks. Um, in a firework, you've got some charcoal and sulfur and potassium nitrate, an oxidizing agent. When you set fire to this mixture, it, it uh, burns with a very hot flame producing a lot of gas. Now, if you produce that gas in a confined space, you have a banger. Um, we've got another diagram here, have we? Uh, yes, there it is. If you arrange to uh, uh, things so that the compartment in which you produce the gas uh, has a tiny pinhole, then you have jet propulsion, and that's the uh, way you get a rocket to leave the ground, to uh, uh, 
leave the ground, of course, you have to do work. So in a firework, there's a lot going on. You've got chemical energy in the sulfur and uh, charcoal, which, when it burns, uh, gives out a lot of heat uh, and, and gas. The, uh, uh, the heat causes the gases to expand in the way that I've described. <coughs> uh, ah, yes. We've got one more example. Uh, in the tongs, he's got a piece of magnesium metal and uh, he's going to set fire to this. Lights out then, please. Well done. Uh, now, apart from this use in fireworks, of course, uh, in the early days of photography, uh, it was used to produce uh, an intense white light, as you see, because the photographic, early photographic plates were so insensitive uh, to, to in ordinary light. <laughs> well, there we've got then heat energy are being converted to coloured light. Are you going to do this, John Shoot? We have only time for this. All right. This goes in the meter. We can do it in the meter. Should I ask him what it is? Yeah, please. Hmm. Uh, don't take it away though, because I need to wire it up. Yeah. Uh, can any of you tell us what this is or what it does in the back there? A solar panel. Can you tell us, please, how a solar panel works? Yes? Yeah? Everybody keep quiet so that we can hear his answer. Oh, very good, yes. What he's saying, I think, is that uh, light energy falls on the panel and is converted to electricity. Well, let's see if we can demonstrate that, Dr. Ballantyne. Can I have my assistance, please? Let's wire this up to the meter. Pop that in the negative for me. Well, it doesn't matter. And then this one goes in the red in here. That'll do. Can you come into the other? That one goes in the negative, which is there, and then in the black one. Hmm. Now you see, without actually using any light, the lights from these, uh, the lights from those overhead lights are giving us six units, seven units of electricity. If I wanted to get some more, I've got a spotlight here, and if I put the spotlight on, it's off the clock. Well, it's off the clock now. So this solar panel, then, is capable of producing quite a lot of energy. So light is being converted into electricity. What I've got here is a little radio. I want to see if we can make the radio work using the light. So here is my radio, and let's connect it up. Can you no put battery in it. The black one in the black for me, just gently. And can you do the other one? The red one goes in the red. So what I've got now is the solar panel is connected to this plug. Can you put that in the radio into there? That's fine. Now, we don't have enough light energy to light up the radio, but I've got a spotlight. Can you switch that on for me? Switch off. The second he switches off, the radio goes off. So this is a very interesting experiment from an energy point of view. 
So let's think it through. I want you to shout out what kind of energy is coming through this wire. Shout. Light. It's not light. Electricity. Electricity. What's coming out of the bulb? Yes. Anything else? Good. So I've got electricity changing into light and heat. In the solar panel, the light has changed into what? Electricity. And in the radio, the electricity has changed into what? Sound. So what we've got is five energy changes in one experiment. Thank you very much. Give him a big hand. Well done, boy. <laughs> so what you've seen then is that we can use electricity to make sound. But to finish off the lecture, there are lots of different ways of making sound. And one of them is my pop gun. <coughs> Children's toy. I'm going to use kinetic energy to make the cork pop. It's on a string, so it comes back again. So there's sound from my work energy. Not a lot of sound. If I want to make a lot more sound, I can do that. Again, it's work energy into sound. Now that's what you'd have in a football field. If you were the referee, you'd have one of these. You hear how loud it is. But if you like quieter things, this is my wife's flute. She was sitting in the back garden the other day and she went like this and a couple of collar doves came down and <laughs> thought that she was making love to them. <laughs> now, as you can appreciate, every musical instrument involves work energy into sound. So we're going to finish the lecture off with an experiment that everybody can do. We're going to change work energy into sound. And we're going to do it to thank Mr. Williams for a lovely lecture. I'm going to ask you to do it again to thank Dr. Ballantyne for his part in it, and Dr. Jones, and also these two gentlemen that have been operating the camera and the sound system. We're very grateful indeed uh, that they've been able to come along this morning and help us to record this lecture. Could you show your piece? So the thought that you'll go away with is energy occurs in different forms which are interconvertible. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you.